Okay, so with this lecture, we begin a new topic. So uh, we will discuss orthogonal polynomials starting from a general perspective, and then we will go on to you know some specific sets of polynomials and and see how some of these general principles will will apply out in, in you know, these specific cases. Okay, so the idea is that we want to come up with a set of polynomials. Let's call them c naught of x, c one of x. C2 of x, so on. It's a an infinite set of polynomials, a countable infinity of such polynomials, where C n of x is going to be a polynomial of degree n. Right. So for every uh, positive integer, you know, include also zero non-negative integer, there is a corresponding polynomial with that degree, and such that all these polynomials, uh, you know, have a a nice relationship with each other. Namely, they are orthogonal to each other. And with respect to a non-negative weight function, which also needs to be defined, and there is also a, an interval which is taken to be between a and b, right? So all these ingredients are essential to define this idea of orthogonality, right? Orthogonality simply means that this integral from a to b, right? That's the interval in which we have, you know, we are considering these are polynomials. Uh, and with respect to this weight function, so if you take this integral a to b, cn of x, cm of x, weight function dx is going to be 0 whenever n is not equal to n. So that's what is meant by orthogonality of uh, these polynomials. And the reason why we need this weight function is, is because, uh, you know, we, we need a the notion of an inner product, right? So, and uh, you know, often you may have a scenario where a and b can go to minus infinity and plus infinity and it is the weight function which is going to ensure that uh, you know these integrals will converge and in a nice way. So in order to ensure convergence of such integrals and for the notion of an inner product uh, to be available, right. So we are going to start thinking of these polynomials as elements of a vector space, right. So and we have seen how it's useful to be able to uh, you know work with the, the notion of an inner product and so these integrals can be thought of as inner products of vectors and for them to be well defined these kinds of integrals have to converge and so w of x is going to play the role of ensuring that such integrals converge. So that's why this weight function is, is important and so let's see just based on some very general observations already several interesting properties can be brought out right so let's say suppose we consider just you know a finite number of elements in this set so the first n elements so we look at c naught of x c1 of x c2 of x all the way up to c n minus 1 of x so the orthogonality condition already implies many uh, you know constraints on the on this set right so some interesting properties immediately follow First of all, we can immediately say that this set of polynomials is linearly independent, right? So the argument is, is you know, it's a, it's a proof by contradiction. Suppose the set is not linearly independent, so that means they are linearly independent. Then we should be able to find some set of coefficients a r such that summation over r going from zero to n minus one a r c r of x equal to zero, right? So these coefficients are non-trivial in the sense that not all of them are zero. But if all of them are zero, then I mean that's the that's not going to make it linearly dependent, right? So that's the definition of linear dependence is that you'll be able to find a set of non-trivial coefficients a r such that you know if you multiply these coefficients with these uh, polynomials and add them up, you should be able to take it to zero, right? So now we can bring in this. Um, weight function and some other gen generic polynomial c n of x from the left side and then integrate within this uh, within this interval of relevant which is relevant to this set of polynomials so from a to b dx c n of x w of x summation over this uh, is zero because uh, you know the quant the sum it's itself is zero and now because it's a finite sum you can change the uh, you know, order of integration. So the, the summation will come come uh, to the left of the integral. And so what it effectively means is uh, this integral a m 0 a to b dx 
डब्ल्यू एफ एक्स सी एम सी एम ऑफ एक्स द होल स्क्वायर इज इक्वल टू जीरो राइट सो वेर वी हैव वी हैव एक्सप्लॉयटेड दिस ऑर्थोगोनॉलिटी प्रॉपर्टी राइट सो इट्स ओनली वेन सी एन इज इक्वल टू आर दस डू गेट ए यू नो पोटेंशियली नॉन जीरो वैल्यू वेल इनफैक्ट इट इज वील आर ग्यू दैट इट इज इट्स अ नॉन जीरो वैल्यू एंड every other one of them if r is not equal to n then this condition immediately sends that object to zero and so there is only one such term which will survive and so this m can of course take all these different values 0 1 2 all the way up to n minus 1 and so now the key point is that the only way for this product so there is some coefficient times this integral which is zero but now we'll argue that this integral cannot be zero right uh, the reason is you this is what is called a normalization integral right so you have this normalization integral and the only way for this to be zero is if this weight function itself were zero but it's that's a trivial scenario we don't want to consider a situation like that and if this weight function is uh, you know is a non negative object and so this is a you know a polynomial square so this polynomial square will cross the uh x axis at most m times right so there is uh no way that this quantity can be zero so that means am is necessarily zero the only way this equation will hold is if am is zero and which in turn means basically it's a contradiction with our or a statement that you know we will be able to find some non trivial coefficients ar Such that this is equal to zero. That's not possible. So the only way you can ensure this type of a result is if all a r are zero, which is the statement that these the set of polynomials is linear is a linearly independent set, right? So it's a linearly independent set, and in fact, it forms an orthogonal basis for expansion of any polynomial in X of degree less than or equal to n minus one, right? So If you take this set of pol these polynomials, so designed c naught of x, c one of x, so on all the way up to c n minus one of x, it will serve as an orthogonal basis for expansion of any polynomial in x of degree less than or equal to one. Right. So the idea is that basically uh, you can think of a linear vector space which is n-dimensional, uh, a real linear um, vector space of polynomials uh, in x. of degree n minus 1 or less and the set this set c not of x c1 of x c2 of x so on all the way up to c n minus 1 of x will serve as a basis for uh for vn right so that's the you know that's a consequence of this the orthogonality basically of all these polynomials now basic the, the orthogonality of these polynomials implies that you know if you if you can take any polynomial and uh you know expand it in terms of these uh, polynomials uh you know be, these are the basis vectors of your space then uh, in fact what you can do is uh you know uh, write down uh you know this equivalent relation so what it means is so whenever you have a cn of x where n is greater than you know any of these p's so consider x to the p where p is an integer which is less than n so x to the p is going to be orthogonal to cn of x right because uh after all c1 c2 uh, c0 c1 c2 all the way up to cn minus 1 contain terms of this kind x to the p right so in fact it's not just all these polynomials which are orthogonal to cn of x but in fact every x to the p where p is less than or equal to n is going to be orthogonal to cn of x right so the reason is you can just uh, you know you can expand x to the p in terms of these polynomials which are all of lower order so because uh, you know all these polynomials up to p form a basis and therefore x to the p is something which can be expanded in terms of these polynomials and therefore when you multiply with cn of x and then uh you multiply by w of x and take this integral from a to b since x to the p itself is expressed in terms of all these polynomials each of them 
term by term will go to 0 and indeed in fact you can argue that x to the p is orthogonal to cn of x whenever p is less than n right so this is this gives us a way to actually sort of generate this polynomial so what you have to do is take every cn of x to be you know orthogonal to every x to the p which is where p is less than n right so if you can generate a set of polynomials c0 you start with c0 then you go to c1 and make sure that c1 is um, is orthogonal to all x to the p where p is less than 1 in this case that is just p equal to 0 if you go to c2 of x you must ensure that c2 of x is orthogonal to uh, x to the 0 and x to the 1 all right so if you can do this then it is actually the same set that you are generating you don't even have to you know go and work with uh, cn being directly orthogonal to you know all cp where p is less than n so you can simply work with uh, these powers x uh, x to the 0 x to the 1 x to x squared x cubed so on and then you are done right so this is a, an immediate consequence of this vector space structure which comes about because of the orthogonality of this polynomial let's look at an example to illustrate what this means this is a rather simple example just to tell you that you know orthogonality is dependent on the weight function and on the on the interval that is being considered suppose you consider these two polynomials c1 of x which is 4x minus 4 and c2 of x some quadratic function 16 x squared minus 32 x plus 14 and suppose we consider this weight function e to the minus 4 x minus 1 the whole square and the interval is taken to be all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity so if you want to check if these two functions are orthogonal to each other with respect to this weight function in this interval what you have to do is carry out this integral and so you'll find that indeed uh, you know if you make this substitution x minus 1 equal to y then the integral becomes so 8 comes out then in place of x minus 1 you have a y then you have an 8y squared plus 7 times e to the minus 4y squared dy and indeed you can actually immediately argue that this is 0 because the integrand is an odd function right so I mean there are other quadratic functions too which will give you this right so whenever uh, any quadratic function which you can construct such that you know this integrand overall if it's if it's going to be an odd function so which will happen if you know there is a y and there is a square of y if it comes in then indeed this is going to be a zero so you'll you'll be able to find many quadratic functions which are orthogonal to this function with respect to this w in this interval right so but on the other hand if you consider the same two functions but with a different weight in a different interval so w of x equal to 1 and in the interval minus 1 to 1 then we would have to look at this integral and with these limits so now you see that the way to carry out this integral is to actually work out this uh, you know this product so what's a quadratic term times a, a linear term will become some cubic term so then we see that although x cube and x are odd functions but you still have these x squared and um, 7 sitting here which means that it's not going to be 0 you can work out the answer but the answer is not important so we are just trying to argue that you know the same two functions are orthogonal to each other with, with respect to a certain weight function in a certain uh, interval but they are not orthogonal with respect to another weight function in a different interval right so that's important to specify okay so i mean we have started with a very sort of general general uh, interval in mind but in fact in print in practice it's useful to convert this interval to one of three different types and it's always possible to do this right one is if, if a and b are finite it's useful to just simply map them to the interval minus one to one right so there is a way to do this there's a linear transformation with which you can do it and if you have you know a is finite but b is plus infinity then you just send a to zero it's convenient to work in this manner and if both a and b are mi minus infinity and plus infinity that's okay so you you leave it as it is Right, so the reason why this uh, you know is possible is because you can make this change of variable you can write x to be cy plus d and c not equal to 0 so all these polynomials uh, you know every polynomial in x will now become a polynomial in y and its degree is unchanged 
right after all it's just a linear transformation now the different polynomials in y are orthogonal to each other but with a new weight function right which must also be readjusted and so the idea behind doing this is is to um, you know work with these new intervals right so if you know x were taking the value a y is going to take a minus d over c and when x takes the value b y is going to take the value b minus d over c and so you can convince yourself that you can always put this a minus d over c to be minus 1 and b minus d over c to be plus 1 provided both a and b are finite if one of them is infinity then you know you can shift the other to 0 right so it it's convenient to you know reduce this generous general nature of a and b and work with these three specific kinds right so this is what we will uh, you know build our structure of orthogonal polynomials using these three different types of intervals okay that's a short introduction to how we are going to start working in from very general principles how we will try to uh, you know look at orthogonal functions then we will see how to construct them and then look at some of their properties and look at specific sets of orthogonal polynomials as we go along that's all for this lecture thank you